Did you know that throughout human history, the popes have stepped out into the world and changed the world as we knew it? They defended the faith. They guided humanity to eternal salvation. Did you know that in the past, the popes have confronted emperors? They defined crucial doctrines, even in the midst of church turmoil. Did you know that the Pope's influence is unparalleled in the Christian world? In today's video, we'll explore the remarkable instances from every century where the Pope's authority made a profound difference. However, I really want to focus on the question, should Pope Francis condemn France's actions during the opening day of the Olympics? Once revered as the eldest daughter of the church, France now has shown its true colors. France now appears to have turned its back on the church, on their spiritual heritage, embracing a new religion. And that religion celebrates sacrilege, blasphemous acts, profane acts, to say the least. Join us as we delve into the implications of these actions and the Pope's potential response to this assault on Christianity. Thank you all so much for checking out this video. Again, my name is Michael Sava, and this channel is called OfTheReturn.com. Today, I want to talk about the crucial question. Should the Pope condemn the actions of this year's opening to France's Olympics? Um, look, uh, everyone tuned in to check out the, the, the opening ceremony of the Olympics, and we saw that Christians were pretty much slapped in the face. Look, guys, we have no time to separate Protestant, Orthodox, uh, uh, Catholic, this was an assault on Christianity in general. Religious images were desecrated, profane acts, and it was also a hostile takeover of one of our most beautiful and cherished images ever. And the only one I'm seeing really making any sort of fight back is Andrew Tate. What a world we live in where Andrew Tate is the one, a newly converted Muslim, uh, being the one to openly voice his rage, our rage, of the desecration of what they did to the image and name of Jesus Christ. And yet our Pope in Rome has not yet said anything. This is not going to be a video where I bash the Pope for 45 minutes, then ask for donations. I'm sorry if that's a slam to other channels, but I'm not going to do that. But stay with me. Learn the role of of the Pope and why I believe he should come out and condemn these actions. Number one, the Pope is the spiritual leader of over one billion Catholics. He is also the spiritual leader to many people in the Protestant area who respect the Pope and the Church. He is also influential for those people that we call people of goodwill, people who are seeking out God, people who want to know God and discover God. And of course, the Pope is influential over the many different Eastern Rites and Orthodox. The Pope has a profound responsibility to shepherd us, to be a leader, and to be strong. According to the Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 892, the Pope has a duty to teach and uphold the faith. His silence does teach us a lesson, to be quiet to allow the world to mock us and do not say anything. Look, his role includes condemning actions that desecrate the religion, that diminish human dignity. In John chapter 2, verses 15 to 16, we see Jesus himself driving out the money changers from the temple, illustrating that, defended sacred, that defending sacred spaces and symbols are, vi are vital. I'm not saying that we should get violent. All I'm asking is to go out into that balcony and to have a stern message to the world. The images of our Lord and Jesus Christ are sacred and stop with, with, with the desecration. Stop with the disrespect. 
Point number two, the Pope as a universal head of Christendom. The Pope is not just the Bishop of Rome. He is the universal pastor of the entire Christian church. This role was established by Christ himself, and that's serious. We see that the Apostle Simon in Matthew chapter 16, verses 18 and 19, gets a new name. But it goes far more beyond that. Jesus told Simon, you are Peter, rock, kepha, and on this rock I will build my church. This signifies the papal authority to guide and protect the faithful globally. We could see it in historical circumstances, such as when Pope Leo I or Pope Leo the Great met with one of the people that sent shockwaves of fear amongst people in Europe, and that is Attila the Hun. Let me quickly tell you the story about Pope Leo I, Pope Leo the Great, and Attila the Hun. In the 5th century, the Western Roman Empire faced significant turmoil due to the invasion of barbarians. One of the most feared leaders, Attila the Hun, now wants to invade Rome. He was a leader of a ruthless group of people who was just devastating Europe. In the year 452, he targeted Rome. He caused widespread panic. Rome was weakened by internal strife, previous invasions, and it seemed defenseless. Pope Leo I, the Bishop of Rome, the one who holds the keys to the kingdom, bravely decided to meet with Attila and to personally discuss with him for, and stop him from attacking the city. Pope Leo and a small delegation met with Attila. And it states that as Pope Leo said these things, Attila stood looking upon his venerable garb, silent, as if he was thinking deeply. And lo, suddenly, there were seen the apostles Peter and Paul, clad like bishops, standing by Leo, the one on his right hand and the other on his left. They held swords stretched out over his head and threatened Attila with death. If he did not obey the Pope's command, wherefore Attila was appeased, he who had raged as one mad, he, by Leo's intercession, straightaway promised a lasting peace and withdrew beyond the area. My friends, no matter how weak of a state that we think the church is, how weak of a state we think the land of God is, or the people of God, or the, the earthly kingdom of God is, we're not thinking about the power of God behind us and how powerful that could be. If the Pope goes and stands up against the world and he feels that he is the only one and it may or may not happen or it may uh, come back to him, he is underestimating the power of God. Now we know that this Pope is compromised. It's true. He comments on everything that is anti-Catholic and stays quiet on things that are Catholic. We know this. However, we can go back to either our tradition here, like Pope Leo I, or we could go back into our scripture. We see from 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 15 to 17, When the servant of the man of God got up, he went out early the next morning, and the army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh no, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. Do not be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed. Open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and he saw the hills full of horses and chariots on fire all around Elisha. 
There is a spiritual element that many of us just do not have faith in anymore. Sometimes we have to step out into the world and just be bold and know that God has our back. Today, many parts of the world have forgotten God, replacing faith with secular ideology, politics, politicians, celebrities, their own thoughts and philosophies. And this has brought a shift that led us to disregard our sacred traditions, our scripture, our values. St. Pope John Paul II often spoke about this when he spoke of the culture of death, where secularism undermines the sanctity of life and religion, undermines the dignity of the human person. The Pope's condemnation of such acts serves as a reminder of the enduring importance of faith in our life. This is when the Pope stands out into the darkness and proclaims the word of God, what is right, what is clear, and just a guide to us. This directly ties to my fifth and final point. The church must return to a neo-Augustinian way of church life. Basically, it sums down or boils down to this. The world is a dark and sinful place. The only beacon of light in this darkness is the church. Only there you can find light. Only there you can find faith. Only there you can find God. And as we know from scripture or just everyday life, the darkness cannot damper the light. And we must be that light. But we must do so uh, with our leadership. The laity cannot do it alone. My voice is not big enough. My voice does not compare to the Pope's voice. Think of the voices today. Right now, if you go on X or Facebook or YouTube or Rumble and so on, we see that Andrew Tate, a newly converted Muslim, is speaking out about this Olympics uh, their opening ceremony, France in general. And he says, I don't want disrespect of Jesus Christ. That image is still a holy image because Jesus is in that image. And they mocked it. And now you have a newly converted Muslim who is speaking with his voice on something Christians should be doing. Now again, I'm not saying violence and neither is he. And I'm not saying the Pope should do that. All I'm saying is we need that voice Christ has that position for a reason. You know, in reflection, when we think about Jesus dying and resurrecting, Jesus makes a point to visit his apostles a couple times. In particular, he meets with Peter. And three times he, tells, he asks Peter, Do you love me? And Peter, every time, Yes, Lord, I love you. And to that response of, yes, Lord, I love you, Peter, or Jesus will tell Peter, then feed my sheep. The world is scary, especially if, you're a vo if you have a voice like the Pope. In the beginning of his papacy, he was scared of ISIS, and he shared that fear. Now he's probably scared of secular society. We know he was scared of China, right? When the cardinal was imprisoned and he was taking money from them during COVID. And we know he's compromised now. He talks about the planet and doesn't mention Jesus Christ. He, he, he talks about uh, values that are not really uh, anywhere in Christian history and scripture or anything like that. And he's bold. He lets people who have very bad backgrounds uh, create these artworks and shares them, which it should not be shared with the church. And yet stay silent on things like um, on a world stage disrespecting Jesus Christ. You know, I go back to the fourth century when we see the Pope commissioning the Vulgate Bible, 
We see in the 5th century, Pope Leo, who met with Attila the Hun. The 6th century, we see the Gregorian mission. We see in the 8th century, Pope Stephen II, the alliance with the Franks. The 9th century, we see Pope Nicholas, dispute with the patriarchs. We see something in every single century. Uh, and I won't read them all to you because I know people will just shut it off. But we see that there is always this connection with uh, the papacy and stepping out with his voice and making something clear, setting the way and preparing the way of the Lord. Thank you all for listening. I don't want anything. Just please like, subscribe, comment. Everything is always done in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.